Hello again, everyone. Welcome to week number three of our New Earth web class. And again, I um, thank you, Eckhart Tolle, thank you for joining us as we bring students and seekers together to discuss our latest book club selection, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. I'm happy once again to see that we've been connecting with readers around the world. We've gotten questions and comments just this week from as far away as Rotterdam, Rio, Beirut, Casablanca, Greece, Seoul, and even, Tas even uh, Tasmania. Hello, Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all of your really so, so thoughtful um, your emails have been. And I can tell you, we love hearing from you wherever you are. There have been either two million of you who have watched our classes uh, live or on streams or downloads. No matter how you're watching, uh, I welcome you to the awakening, um, the shift in consciousness that ha that's happening really all over the planet. So I want to get started on Chapter 3. As you see on your screen, you can uh, type in your questions and send them to us instantly throughout the class. We're going to be speaking with students via Skype. You know, Skype is that free software that allows you to make internet and video phone calls from all over the world. Welcome again. Thank you. Did you have a good week? Very good. Thanks. Very good. <laughs> so if we were to summarize, last week we were talking about how um, the current state of humanity is that we are humans here living on the planet Earth, have an ego, and learning to manage that ego is what this book is all about. Yes, and going beyond ego at the same time means going beyond what the Buddha described as the normal human condition, which is one of suffering. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately the ego, sooner or later, and usually sooner, always produces some form of suffering. So it's really transcending the ego, going beyond the ego, at the same time means going beyond this unconscious urge to generate more and more suffering both in people's personal lives as well as collectively. Well, we did something last week that was uh, unprecedented. You said it's never been done before on television where you just sit there in silence. I, I, and I thought a lot of people responded to the sense of connection from that. So you want to do that again? Yes. Let's do that again. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're going to lead us in silence? Okay. I'll just maybe uh, one or two little hints about what to do with your mind when you go into silence because not speaking isn't complete silence yet because usually even though you're not speaking the mind is still active and producing noise so how to stop the mind from producing noise or how to reduce the amount of noise that the mind produces is quite easy you take your attention away from the mind from thinking and we did that already last week and simply become aware that you are breathing. The air flows in and out and you feel yourself breathing. Air flows in and out of the body. And so as we go into silence now for a few seconds, just direct your attention and feel your own breath. was nice. Yes. Today's lesson, chapter three, beginning on page 59. I love the idea that we're all literally on the same page. <laughs> Everybody, page 59, the core of the ego. Most people are so completely identified with the voice in the head, the incessant stream of involuntary and compulsive thinking, and the emotions that accompany it, that we may describe them as being possessed by their mind. My question to you, if we are not that constant stream of thinking, then who are we? Now, that question usually would be answered by the mind by giving some kind of concept of who we are. Now, Yes, there, I am female. This, that. I am African American. Yes. I work on TV. Yes. My mother was. My mother is. Yes. I live at. That's my job that. is. Yes. yes. That's how most people, if you say, who are you? Yes, but beyond that, 
because concepts refer to who we are temporarily in the world of form. You're a mother, you're a father, you have a certain profession, a certain, belong to a certain race, you're a man or a woman, nationality, all these things. Now, when you ask who are we beyond that, there is no conceptual answer to that. that would, uh, no conceptual answer would be absolutely correct. We can give little hints. We can say we are the formless consciousness behind all that. Mm. We are that which cannot be defined mm. through concepts or words. So knowing who you are is not, does not mean that suddenly you have some new idea in your head and say, oh, now I'll let me tell you who I am. I've discovered who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, you get closer to knowing you, who you are. If you come to a stage where you have that feeling, and I mention it in the book somewhere, you, when people tell me, I don't know who I am anymore because they have realized who they are not. Mm -hmm. They are ultimately not their profession. They are not whatever function they fulfill. They are not their nationality. So they now, they're beginning to realize that's not really who I am. But then they, they, they enter the unknown and they say, well, if I'm not that, now I'm no longer sure who I am. And I always congratulate people when they say, I'm not sure who I am anymore. And I say, well, that you, usually connotes confusion. Confusion, if you still want to know who you are. But if you can become comfortable with not knowing who you are, with not defining yourself mm -hmm. to yourself or to others, mainly to yourself, because the ego is constantly a self-definition to remind yourself who you are, you remember your story of your past and mm -hmm. so on. You, do, you have opinions about yourself and so you, this is the self-definition. But Letting, don't we obviously need the ego, Eckhart? Don't we obviously need it? Otherwise, why would we have it? Why wouldn't we have evolved past it? That's, we're doing that now. Mm -hmm. So it's been a stage in the evolution of consciousness, a necessary stage in the evolution of consciousness. For survival. Yes, yes. Because? The ego arose because we started to think. So the ability in humans, suddenly humans develop the ability to differentiate and to think. To me, the beginning of the Old Testament really describes the beginning of the ability to think because what it says in the Old Testament is they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the ability to say this is good, this is bad, to differentiate, starting to think. Mm -hmm. So the ability to think arose in our species, which was a wonderful thing on the one hand, but over many, many millennia, hundreds of thousands of years, more and more our original sense of connectedness with life and with being, which the natural world still has, animals mm -hmm. still have that. They, they live in a state of natural and some cultures connected. did. We some of ancient Native cultures, Americans that's and, right. Yes. They still have that, a sense of being rooted, being comfortable in your own skin, being rooted deeply within and feel that sense of oneness with the totality of life, oneness with life itself. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had, humanity had that once, and as you say, some ancient cultures, perhaps there's still remnants of ancient cultures, and they still have that. Mm -hmm. and, but humans, as they went into more and more thinking and differentiation, they gradually, their sense of self gradually moved from from the center of their being, which I would describe as their heart or the solar mm -hmm. plexus, into their mind. Into their mind. And they more and more they b began to identify mm -hmm. with the movement of thought. And gradually, out of this continuous identification with the movement of thought, a thought-made entity was uh, produced, which is mm -hmm. the ego. Yeah, which is what you're saying is being possessed by our mind. Yes. Okay. By being possessed by our minds. Okay, you say this is the egoic mind, and we call it egoic because there's a sense of self, of I, in every thought, every memory, every interpretation, opinion, so forth. And this is unconsciousness, spiritually speaking. Yes, because you, you identify with thought rather than being identifying with the your inner essence, which is what we lost, which is the state of Eden or paradise, as it's described in in the Bible. In the Bible. We lost that, and it's not only in the Bible. There are many 
ancient cultures where they speak of the golden age that we lost in many different cultures. And you say egos are all the same on the surface. They only, uh, they differ only yeah. on the surface. Deep down, they're all the same. Yes. Okay. Now, chapter three is all about the core of the ego, what makes it thrive. Yes. And you say that, um, uh, that what we, what we react to in another, we strengthen in ourselves. Can you give us an example of that? One of the things the, need, the ego needs to survive is reacting against other people. What you react to in another, you strengthen in yourself, you say. Yes, that's uh, usually what we react to most strongly in others and what we most strongly condemn in others is usually something that we also have, a trait that we also have, but that we are unconscious of in ourselves. So when we, for example, we become upset if we encounter somebody who is very greedy, Mm -hmm. uh, or we could become upset about somebody who is d uh, d um, dishonest, no matter who. The, what, the, the force of your reaction usually tells you uh, that th th something in you th you need to look at. Really? All the time? All the time? Well, it's for you to find out, or any, anybody to find out in their own lives. When you react strongly, you have to then become alert and have a look inside. Okay, you say complaining is one of the ego's favorite strategy, strategies for strengthening itself. Every complaint is a little story the mind makes up that you completely believe in. Yes, now that's a very common thing and perhaps un until people begin to become more aware and Some egos survive mind. on complaining. Some egos who haven't got much else to identify with, uh, they can survive on complaining alone. So then the continuously you are condemning other people, you are continuously criticizing, condemning, or n judging negatively situations that you're in, your surroundings, other people. So the ego is the identification with those thoughts. It's not necessarily the thought. No, it's the, it's the, it's the thing that you become, uh, you become those thoughts. Okay. You're, you're, there's no space between you and the thought. Got that. Okay. All right. So... Name-calling is also a form that the ego, you know, yes. defines itself. Yes, and that, of course, one would, could say, well, it's relatively harmless. On, on one level, it's relatively harmless to, 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 to call a person this or that, to attach a label to a person. But if you follow this uh, up to see, you can, you can actually see how uh, dreadful it is to label another human being or another a group of human beings because once you have labeled you've attached a mental label to another human being you can you have desensitized yourself to the aliveness and the humanity of that other human being because you're relating now to a label so if you say he's a whatever it may be he's a communist he's this he's that any any label and immediately instead of sensing the aliveness of that human being and have some empathy with that, you have cut yourself off and you have a label. In chapter four, you talk about that, that role playing, how we do it in temporary ways. I'm the, you know, I'm the person who's going in the yes. store, I'm the customer, and there's That's the clerk. Another, yes. The person who labels himself the clerk and I'm the customer, there's a certain defined behavior that we have. Yes. yes, and then when it's done collectively, the labeling, when an entire nation labels another nation in a yeah. certain way. Yeah, or I'm the boss and you're the janitor. Yes. Or you're my subordinate. Yes, yes. all these are forms of mental labeling. Mm -hmm. So they all, any kind of mental label that you are completely identified with desensitizes you to the humanity of the, and then of the other human being. Okay. And then all kinds of things are possible, even violence becomes Okay, I got it. Everybody, I just got this. You got this. Remember two weeks ago, we were talking about walking under the trees, feeling nature, not labeling the flowers, being able to experience the essence of the flowers. What you're saying here is you're labeling people as he's a jerk or he's a whatever. Once you start doing that, you become desensitized to who they really are in the same way that you were when you were labeling things in nature. Yes. Okay. Right, exactly. Okay, we have Bill. Hello, Bill. Talked to you earlier today. Hey, Oprah. Oprah, how are you? Hi. Bill's in Connecticut on Skype. Bill and I uh, Skyped on uh, the Oprah show earlier today. What's your question to us now? Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, Eckhart, I'd like to say that this book is indicative to the quintessential essence of life. 
This is incredible reading. I have a very simple question. What, do you compare the egoic mind to the subconscious? I don't use those terms, but uh, uh, because they are a completely different frame of reference, there is, of course, a lot of subconscious activity in the egoic mind also. All we right, need to or, be... or do, do they run in conjunction with each other, or are they separate? Essentially, the ego is the ego for the ego to survive, for the ego to thrive, uh -huh. you need to be unconscious of it. So uh, the way I see it, I would describe the entire egoic functioning as a part of the unconsciousness. And it's, yeah, only, yeah. it's only when you become aware of those patterns that operate in your own mind that you are stepping out of the unconsciousness. And this is why we call it awakening. And when you suddenly become aware, even of initially perhaps, of just a tiny pattern in your, in your mind. For example, we talked about complaining. If you become aware that often during the day you complain uselessly because it serves no purpose about other people or situations and suddenly say, oh, there's the complaining voice in my head. Not only do you say there's the complaining voice, there is a deeper a dimension of consciousness that has suddenly come forth from where you can be aware of that voice. And what you're saying is you, we are the awareness. That's right. We are the awareness. You are, this is essentially who you are. You are not all those things that the awareness can be conscious of, the, all right. the, the labels or whatever. You are the consciousness or the awareness You are itself. the awareness. And as long as you don't know that... did not that blow your mind, Bill? And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I'm washed away here. <laughs> <laughs> what is so fascinating, I was sharing this with Eckhart as uh, we were preparing for tonight's lesson, that I received an email from you through our message boards where you were talking about how your life was sort of spiraling downhill, you were not communicating with your wife, you were sort of... I wasn't, uh, Oprah, I wasn't communicating with anybody. I was just, I was stagnating, and I needed a wake-up call, and I was, I, was, I was on the search. And when I heard you mention this book, it was the name that stuck, A New Earth. You know, that's really cool. I really have to check that out. Mm -hmm. And it took me five weeks to buy the book, but, you know, it's my manual for life. It's, it's just, it's an incredible uh, composition. It, it, it truly is. So uh, you, you were saying on the Oprah show earlier today, many people are joining us this evening who weren't uh, a part of the Oprah show, but you were saying on the Oprah show earlier today when we were Skyping that you sat down, you were going to give it a couple of hours and then... Yeah, yeah. I figured, you know, I'll knock off two or three chapters. I got so consumed in this, in this, this whole wave of, of, of writing I was like, wow, I can't put it down. And, it, you know, 12 hours later, I closed the cover and I went, wow, what an incredible ride. Okay, and what was the and biggest realization? Hey, Bill, what was the biggest realization for you? The biggest realization, you know, the whole book itself was a realization. I didn't have any one chapter or any one paragraph. I went through, it really started on chapter three for me. From chapter three, it went to the next chapter, the chapter after that, how we're brought up, how we live in a dysfunctional life. And Oprah, let me tell you something. I grew up in one of the most dysfunctional families you'd ever want to know. And this is something that we carry with us. Your pain and body. I, I've said that, you know, this is a manual for life. We're, we're thrown out there. We're not given, you know, we get a manual for our cars, yeah. our, our appliances, our electronics, but we're thrown out there. And, you know, as young adults, it's like, go do your thing. But while we're doing our, our thing, we're consumed in all of the negativity that is in society, the negativity that's in our families. And it's, you know, we can take ourselves so far, but this book can take us a whole lot farther. Well, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Bill, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad uh, yeah. you were around when I uh, was talking about the book. I got to tell you something. You are, you're, I, I don't know where you came from, and I did read in the book that you were studying a, you, 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 you never, you know, said what kind of a career you were on in the book. You just said that you were studying for a lucrative career, and you, you 
got off the beaten path and went into the spiritual realm. I've got to tell you something, my friend. We need more people like you. Wow. Bill, I thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank I'm you. So Where were you? What were you doing? That's a good point <laughs> that Bill brings up. What were you doing before? The uh, last week you said that your thing was you never thought you were so cute. No, I, but that you had I, that you thought <laughs> you thought that you had such a great intellectual mind. Yes, so what were I you was doing? An intellectual. I got into university fairly late because I left school at 13 or 14. Uh, and then later, when I was 18, I went to live in England, and then I took, suddenly became interested in intellectual things. I was searching. I was becoming already more and more unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I thought all the answers would be found on the intellectual level. So, so what were you planning on doing? Not being uh, a spiritual teacher, obviously. No, becoming a professor, uh -huh. and, and then have all the answers mm -hmm. to life. And then after a while, I realized they don't have the answers. Wow. And I became more and more depressed and unhappy, and then suddenly something snapped inside, and uh, this disidentification from my mind happened. Yes. Which happened uh, to our friend uh, Bill, Bill um, while he was reading the book, because when somebody reads the book and has such a powerful response uh -huh. to it, that means the, the reading of the book coincides with his own awakening, uh -huh. as he reads. But this happens because he was so ready for it. Because he was, he was ready. ready for it. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to see when that happens. When that happens. But, OK, we were talking earlier about the, the ego loves complaining. First of all, loves to believe, loves to identify with the thoughts in the head and believe those thoughts, and loves to complain. But aren't there some things legitimately worth complaining about? You know, you, you know, anybody who's ever gone into house construction at some point or another is told a story by the construction workers, unless you have the most amazing, you know, that this is going to be finished at a certain time or it's going to be a certain price, and then it does, often doesn't turn out to be what you expected. That's a complaint a lot of people have. Yes. Isn't that legitimate? Yes. Like you talk in the book about, my soup is cold. Yes, in a and restaurant. Yeah, in a restaurant. My yes. soup is cold. Sometimes your soup is cold. That's right. Yes. So first of all, the complaining that we are talking about mainly here, the egoic complaining, most of that fulfills no real purpose because mm -hmm. it's not meant to bring about change in any situation. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's so, complaining and resentment complaining. Yes, it, that, and a lot of it for many people happens only in the head. Sometimes right. they verbalize it also, but a lot of the complaining happens in the head alone. But no matter whether they verbalize it or whether the complaining happens in the head alone, in probably 90% of cases, it has no real purpose because it's not meant to bring about change. Mm -hmm. It's meant to strengthen the ego. I see that. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, of course, that. as there are situations, of course, where something needs to be said in order to bring about change in the situation. And that's a completely different kind of complaining where you say something in, so that change can happen. For example, the cold soup in the restaurant. You say, right. the soup is cold, please bring me hot, hot soup. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You could call that also complaining. And there are also two ways of, as far as this kind of complaining is concerned, that is connected to a real situation and is meant to bring about change. Mm -hmm. There's one way of complaining with, with ego in that situation also. And that is when you, the ego is attempting to make somebody wrong. A personal element comes into it, and it's, it's a negativity that flows into to it. To make somebody wrong because my soup is cold. Yes. The, Damn it. That's right. Yeah. You're personalizing it. Mm -hmm. And so you're making a, another person almost, one could say, into an enemy when right. you complain in that way. So whether it's somebody who is a builder who is working on your home, there, and so you, there is a way of complaining. I wouldn't even perhaps call it complaining, of simply stating what the situation stating is. Stating the facts. Yes, without the negativity that flows into it when the ego does it. Mm -hmm. And so that can be practiced. And it's the, whatever you are stating in order to bring about change is actually going to be much more effective mm -hmm. if it's done without the negativity. Because if it comes with negativity, it provokes a negative reaction in the other. And so the whole situation then becomes a conflict situation. Because you say, see if you can catch, that is to say, notice the voice in the head. Perhaps I'm on page 64, everybody, second paragraph. Perhaps in the very moment it complains about something, recognize it for what it is. 
the voice of the ego. And then later you say, the moment you become aware of the ego in you, this is mid-paragraph, it's strictly speaking no longer the ego, but just an old conditioned mind pattern. Yes, because ego means you're not aware of it. So ego means unconsciousness. So a good thing that people can ask themselves when they become aware of this complaining voice in the head or the verbalized complaining voice, is this meant to bring about change in the situation? And if they look at it clearly, they often they will say no. No, it's just hearing myself complain. Yes. Because it keeps fueling my sense of righteousness. Yes. And, and, and rightness. And what the complaining voice also loves is to get confirmation from somebody else that yes, you're, you're right to complain. So then two people join. Oh, yeah. And then you just fuel it. <laughs> on and on and on yeah. and on. I love it. That's right. Doris is Skyping us from outside of London. Uh, England. Doris, what's your question? Hello. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hello. What an amazing day or evening. Um, the book resonated very deeply within me, I must say. And uh, reading the, on, on page 62, the, sec the first paragraph, resentment is the emotion that goes with complaining. It started the question within me, and I thought, like, but where do hurt, hurt feelings belong to? Is this something that my ego tells me to feel, or where do they come from, Eckhart? Can you give a situation, an actual situation? It's always easier to talk about this when you can look at an actual situation where, for well, example, her, you experience... Well, hurt feelings, you know, can have, most of the time, is some outside. Either way, somebody is telling you something that hurts you personally, okay. but what about sadness? You know, you lose a person, or, you know, Hurt feelings come from many different sources. Where do they come from? Yes. How do they relate to the ego? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, often it happens that um, even, let's say, somebody criticizes you mm -hmm. and you feel hurt mm -hmm. because perhaps uh, you had, were attached to what you were doing and you right. feel hurt. Now, what is it in you that feels hurt? And yes, it is the ego that feels hurt. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, all you do is... First of all, you, you can't say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling hurt and I shouldn't have an ego. It doesn't work. You simply accept that this yeah. is what you are feeling right now and you recognize what it is in you that is producing ah, the feeling. Ah, okay, it just take a, it in. It's a mental image of yourself that has become hurt. Mm -hmm. Because most people mm -hmm. think of themselves as, as good people. Mm -hmm. or, and if somebody says you're no good, Immediately, something feeds her, and many people get extremely angry. They're not only hurt, for many people, that immediately turns into anger. Uh, and so the ego wants to immediately defend itself, even driving in traffic. Right. Often, let's say you're driving, and another driver suddenly calls you idiot. That hurts. On one level, it hurts. It hurts the ego, and usually, immediately the ego goes into self-repair mode, as I call it, mm -hmm. and will shout something back in order to repair itself. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm laughing at you because, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if somebody calls me an idiot, I was one, somebody gave me the finger once, and I was like, gee, that's... You gave me the finger. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think... I, I don't remember being hurt about it. I was so stunned by it. But, 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 but yeah. Other, many people would be hurt. Yeah. But you were not because you were... You I were thought, what, what, what a bad day he's having. Yes, you were yeah. in touch with the deeper level of yourself where nothing is hurt. Yeah. Where it, you can't be hurt on or, that or level. When I used to take taxis all the time, when I'd have a taxi driver in a really bad mood, the worst he... If he was in a horrible mood, I would tip him double extra so that he'd be nicer for the next person. <laughs> really? Good. That's yeah. a good one. <laughs> there was even, there's a, a story about a, um, a, an official in Japan, a high government official went to see a Zen master and he asked the Zen master, can you explain to me what the self is? Self really means mm. ego, because there's talk about the self in Buddhism. Can you explain to me what the self is? And the Zen master said, what a stupid question is that? Why you ask me such stupid questions? And immediately the, the government official said, how dare you talk to me like that? Don't you know who I am? <laughs> and the master said, that's the ego. That's the ego. Yeah. All right, <laughs> got it, got it. Now this, this person got hurt, but in him, it, he, immediately the hurt turned into anger. So anytime you have hurt feelings, that is your ego? Yes. yes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you say here, uh, also, uh, Doris, on page 65, he says, a long-standing resentment is called a grievance. To carry a grievance is to be in a permanent state of against, and that is why grievances constitute a significant part of many people's ego. Collective grievances can survive for centuries in the psyche of a yeah. nation, we yeah. know that, yes. or tribe, and fuel a never-ending cycle of violence. And so yeah, I guess all of us need to ask, what are the grievances yes. that we allow ourselves to carry? Yes. Yeah. Family grievances. Families. That, that carry on, and you don't even you forget why you're carrying the grievance. Yes. yes. Personal grievances, family grievances, grievances between tribes, religious groups, nations, and so on. Dreadful. And so are you saying no grievance has a justification, that all, all grievances are based in the, as the core of the ego? It's an essential part of the ego to hold grievances. The ego keeps itself alive. That's one of the ways in which the ego keeps itself alive. You also say on page 66 here, Doris, don't try to let go of the grievance. Trying to let go to forgive does not work. Forgiveness happens naturally mm -hmm. when you see that it has no purpose other than to strengthen a false sense of yourself. Forgiveness happens yeah. when you realize that being resentful is only to build up your ego, yes. that that resentment is only helping you carry around this false sense of who you are. Yes. I got that. Yes. I got that. You got that, Doris? And yes, I got it, too. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, too. Good. All the way in London. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All the way over here. Thank you. We have Tim, a retired Air Force officer who lives in Sicily on the line. Hi, Tim. Your question? Hello, Oprah. How are you doing? Good. Good to talk to you. Hey, good to talk to you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be talking to you and uh, Eckhart. Okay. Your question? I, I want to put this in uh, context first. Uh, I'm jumping ahead to page 74 where uh, Eckhart uh, mentions that sometimes you... Uh, you need to protect yourself against the uh, deeply unconscious. So in that context, my question is, uh, in the case of war, if I protect myself and others via violence, I seem to be part of the insanity that uh, he talks about. But, it, but to surrender our lives to you know, any unconscious uh, mass of people seems to push us closer to, ex to extinction. Um, and uh, I guess my question is, are my defensive actions bringing humankind closer to or further away from a collective enlightenment? And then as a follow-up, I would just ask, uh, you know, is it possible, um, personally, can I fight a war and uh, stay in the present, you know, keep that space between my ego and, and my true self? Ooh, that's a, I, those are brilliant questions. Thoughtful. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. No, no, for thank you. Thank you. I have personally known people and read accounts of people who actually experienced an awakening in the midst of the turmoil of a war situation. Uh, when death was imminent, could happen at any second, and something within them suddenly disidentified. The ego broke down in the midst of the suffering generated by that situation. The ego collapsed, as it also has happened to people even in concentration camps and prison camps. Mm -hmm. I regularly get letters from people in prison who tell me that they have suddenly become free. They are still in prison, but they consider themselves free. Yeah. So we are, we are talking a bit, perhaps here not only about war, but any kind of situation that usually would be described as extremely negative and unconscious. And is it possible to awaken there. Yes, it happens. I say that every human being has a spiritual teacher. For most humans, their spiritual teacher is their suffering. And a war situation is an extreme form of suffering. And ultimately, whatever happens here will, will lead us to awakening, even something that looks on the surface very negative, like a war situation. Eventually, even that will lead us into an awakening, and it's already happening. So, yes, it is possible in the midst of war to suddenly awaken, 
What will happen then, I cannot foretell. It depends on whatever the situation is. It is also true to say that once you have awakened, it is very unlikely that you will still become part of violence. I'm not saying it could not happen, nothing can be said categorically, mm -hmm. but you no longer resonate with violence. Now, so that if war will no longer happen when a, a certain number of people have, I don't know what the critical mass is, mm -hmm. a certain number of people have entered the awakened state, so they no longer generate the unconsciousness, the negativity that produces war. That's Perhaps that's where we're evolving to. We are evolving to. We that. haven't done so good in the 20th century nor 21st. No, the 20th century far. was dreadful, the most dreadful, it, almost as if the ego had reached a climax there, the madness yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. And we can see a lot of that still flowing now into the 21st century also, but at the same time, something is happening in this century that is quite unprecedented, well it started in the later part of the last century, this awakening is quite unprecedented. Well, if you look for example at previous war situations, um, there was very little... Uh, Challenges to it. Yes, yeah. the, it was never challenged by the people. That's right. And now this is very different. Right. You actually say in Chapter 4, you talk about how the hippie movement yes. in the United States brought about a shift in consciousness. Yes. The movement itself started to fall apart. But the hippies actually brought uh, a challenge to the status quo as we knew it. The hippies said... Yes. They also, it was a disidentification from the collective image. The right. Collective, uh, which up to that point, people had very strongly identified with the collective. Behaved a certain way, very did things as they were told, obeyed the status quo. Yes. yes. All right. Um, you say um, ego takes everything personally. Back to what Doris was saying earlier. Ego takes everything personally. Emotion arises, uh, defensiveness, perhaps even aggression. Are you defending the truth? No, the truth in any case needs no defense. Yeah. Yes. So when people argue, usually an argument, often arguments turn into violence. If people are very unconscious, and many mm -hmm. people still are, arguments turn into violence. Mm -hmm. so, so when people argue about something, usually what happens is they are so identified with their opinion... Of on, being right. Yes, being right, their mental position, uh -huh. that any questioning of their mental position, of their opinion or their viewpoint, is regarded as an attack mm -hmm. on them. Yeah. And this is how the ego gets confused with who you are. You know, I will tell you a funny story that I was reading this book and Stebbin and I were at dinner, um, just the two of us, talking about uh, what are the most important questions in life. And I said, I, said one of the, I, think, I believe one of the most important questions in life is to, to know whether or not, it's just to, to know to believe whether the universe is compassionate or not compassionate. And he said, well, I disagree with you. I think the most important thing is whether or not you know how to work on your strengths. And I go, well, that's ridiculous, because the most important thing is, do you believe that whether the universe is compassionate or not? And uh, so we're arguing about whether or not the universe is compassionate or not compassionate. And he didn't agree with my, uh, my view. And I said, well, you know, I know I'm right. I ended up clearing the table, leaving the table, and going upstairs because <laughs> I don't want to have the conversation anymore. And, uh, a f you know, a half an hour passes. He comes up and he says, okay, you're right. You're right. And I go, never mind. I don't need to be right. I don't, I don't need to be right. Um, and then I realize that, yes, that is exactly what happened. Yes. My ego is arguing because it is defending its right to be right. Yes. Yeah. Identification with a mental position, with a concept in the head. Yes. Can happen so easily. Right. And we're talking about compassionate issues. Yes. Or non-compassionate issues. Uh, yes. Yeah. <sighs> well, my friend Kadada Jones, uh, who I was at uh, her father's... Uh, 75th birthday party the other night. Quincy Jones turned 75, everybody. And uh, Kadada was there, his daughter. And we started talking about a new earth, and she had so many questions that I said, Kadada, why don't you just Skype us on Monday? And here you are. Hello, Kadada. 
Hi, Eckhart. Hi, Oprah. How are you? Uh, hi. And your question? Okay, my question is, this book hits me really, really deep in my heart, and I know it to be the truth, but I have such resistance, and I feel like if everything in form is an illusion, it feels really disenchanting. And I'm at a point in my life where I have goals, I'm excited about my career, I want to have kids, I want to meet a great partner. And if it's all illusion, where's the fun? Uh, there's... Not my ego. <laughs> you are not meant to believe that all is illusion. At, for, at, you're at a stage in your life where you can simply enjoy the play of form. Eventually, you will come to a point, as every human does, where the, the forms in your life are, are no longer are completely satisfying. They leave a certain emptiness, they leave a frustration, but you haven't reached that point yet, that's fine. In the meantime, you enjoy your life, be as present as you can, which means uh, don't project yourself continuously into some future moment that promises you more and greater fulfillment. But if, if that happens, and if you can't help it, that's mm -hmm. fine too. Mm -hmm. But it, why not enjoy this moment as it is, really? Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. This is not to take the joy out of life. It's to really deepen the way in which you live, rather than living on the surface of things and expecting fulfillment through super, relatively superficial things. Mm -hmm going deeper to a place where true joy resides. I know. I think that's a good question, though, that you, you raise, Kadata, especially uh, I've heard this from a lot of people your age who say, so now where is ambition? Ambition is ambition my ego? Good question. You want to hit career strides. You want to see things happen. You're excited to meet somebody. You're going to have a baby that you're going to be madly in love with. And then I hear Eckhart's voice. And I have to remember my ego, remember that it's form, and it just kind of makes me feel a little unexcited. But I guess it's about being in the moment, so. No, there comes a point mm -hmm. when you can see the truth of this very clearly in your own life. Uh -huh. Until you can see the truth of it very clearly in your own life, in your own life, the, uh, the book remains on the conceptual level. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't say that there's anything in the book that you should believe in. Mm -hmm. If the book works for you, the truth of it is immediately recognized, like in Bill, mm -hmm. uh, we talked to earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The truth of it is immediately recognized, and there's a sense of, ah, yes. But at 20, I would not have understood the truth in this book. I had ambitions. I wanted to become a great professor. I wanted to be seen as to be successful. I wanted to show to the world that I can make it. So I was working hard. If at that point I had read this book, I would have said the same as you. I don't want this right now. <laughs> I don't need this. Mm -hmm. The book really, as long as you feel that you don't really need it, it's fine. You should carry on with what you're doing. I don't even hear her saying she doesn't need it. I think... I, I totally need it. I totally <laughs> know that this book is real and true. And I'm actually turning 34 in a week. So. It's really, really, really important for me to figure out how to integrate consciousness into this next chapter. I want to approach it in a very conscious way. But there's still probably a little part of me, a lot of part of me, that's gripping on to the form. I live in Los Angeles. I'm in a business where form is at the forefront. It's kind of a hard balance. I'm just wondering how do you reap the fruits and not identify to the form? Yes, forms, you can enjoy the forms. And you can really only truly enjoy the forms if you're not completely identified with the forms. Good. Because if you're completely identified with the forms, there's always an element of fear that the form might leave you, you mm -hmm. the situation that you have, whatever, you, the form might leave you, or uh, it will suddenly, the form will no longer be satisfying. So it's, the attachment to the form doesn't really mean that you enjoy it. The attachment to the form produces negativity and produces fear around it around your life situation. It's doing, a, a Kadata, what I said, I think, on an earlier class. It's like, especially in Los Angeles, you know, great fun, fun city, uh, city of the angels there. It's like being able to be in the world, but not of it. Yes, yes. To be and, in the world, but not of it. Yes, and a lot of that, the attachment um, is less likely to be there. The more present you are, 
with any life experience, the more present you are in the moment, then you are not, you are not attached. The attachment needs future, needs more, looks to the future, is, is either as a threat or hope. So be as present as you can in every situation in your life, in every moment in your life. Yeah. And what you were talking about, I think, in one of the future chapters about being able to be present with your children instead yes. of just sort of going through the motions with your children, yes. being present with your children. Hey, Kadada, great to see you on Skype. Thank you for having me. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Let's go to our study group who's watching our webcast at Borders on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I hear Jamie is there and has a question. Yes. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. Uh, my name is Jamie. Um, my question is, on page 83, you mention how fame especially is such a downfall for the ego. And I'm just um, wondering, Oprah, how you manage to keep everything so grounded. Oh. I've been meaning to ask you that, too. Really? <laughs> oh, thanks for bringing uh. that up, Jamie. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, how do I manage to keep everything so grounded? I can think, I, I, I believe that I'm not attached to the fame. I, I don't know that to be true since I have been, quote, famous for most of my adult life. But I believe that I really am, um, that what I do comes from such a, 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 you know, I consider myself blessed. And I get, I'm blessed because I have a, acquired fame and attention and money by being myself. That's it. It, you don't play roles. Yeah, it's not. I don't have to be anybody other than myself, and so. And that's very rare on television. Almost everybody is playing a role. Right. And your success is, success is due to the fact that you are yourself. Right. You're the same person outside television as you are here on, in mm -hmm. the studio. So, and really, that can apply, apply to anybody. The more you are truly yourself and not playing roles, the more powerful you are. The ego tells you you need to play some role, mm -hmm. but your true power lies in not playing a role. I will say this, when I first started television, I was uh, a, a news reporter and never was satisfied. I always felt that I was exploiting people. I, my whole day built, was based around finding the worst story possible to report. And also, I was an anchor woman, and something would happen uh, Jamie, when the light would come on, like on this camera, there's a little red light on, and all of a sudden I'd be like talking like I am now, and the light would come on, and I would suddenly go into my newswoman anchor voice and, uh, and play the role of the newswoman anchor person that I thought I was supposed to be. And one night I was reading some copy that I hadn't pre-read, and I was naming a lot of countries, and Canada was in, in, on the list, and I called Canada, Canada. <laughs> and I started... <laughs> cracking myself up that I said, did I just call Canada Canada? And that was the breakthrough moment for me on television. That was the breakthrough moment where I, where I was able for just a you know, few seconds break through the wall of my facade as an anchor woman who knows all of the different countries and in Canada. And uh, that, that moment was such a funny moment for me. I couldn't stop laughing and uh, started the process of me being able to be myself on the air, that first little glimpse of it. So did you have a question for Eckhart? With all, you know, this um, webcast and being on Oprah, obviously you've come into incredible fame, and I I'm, I'm, didn't ask you the question because this has been what you've been preaching since, you know, since you wrote The Power of Now, but do you anticipate, are you just completely self-actualized, you don't expect this to be a problem, or...? How can you expect fame to come in into play for you at all now? Yeah. No, this is so funny. Uh, Amy Gross, who's the editor of O Magazine, who's also a pretty centered person, we were talking about, uh, Eckhart did, uh, did an article for us uh, from a conversation that we had earlier in O Magazine in our May issue. And so we were talking about Eckhart coming for the f first session a couple weeks ago. She says, won't we all be surprised if Eckhart comes in in a fur hat and uh, three pounds of bling, wearing sunglasses with an entourage. <laughs> if Eckhart walks in and go, yo, what's up? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it's affected him because this is so funny. When I first called Eckhart months ago, months and months, I don't even know how long ago it was, to tell Eckhart that uh, I was going to be choosing uh, a New Earth as our book club selection. I think it's our 61st selection or whatever. 
uh, he was very, he was so calm about it. Later, one of the producers says, well, did you call him? Did you call him? And I said, yeah, I called him. And she said, well, was he excited? And I said, I think for him that was excitement. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm choosing the book. He goes, yes. <laughs> Very good. So anyway, I, I don't think it's gone to his head yet. And I and listen, so far, no bling. <laughs> when, it, when it happens, then you'll know the ego has come back. I'll know the, Let me know. I will. Because <laughs> I won't know it if it's come back. <laughs> when Eckhart comes in wearing two earrings, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> OK. Let's see. Thank you so much, Jamie. And all the group from Borders, thank you for being there every week. Yay, Borders! <laughs> Michigan Avenue! <laughs> Let's see some of the email questions uh, you've been sending during uh, our class on our computer screen here. Um, this is Melissa from uh, Crab Orchard, West Virginia. She says she's being awakened with worry. My sister's addicted to drugs. She's been through rehab to no avail. Every day we worry about her. We fear she may die if she continues. My question is this. How can we live awakened with this major, major distraction in our lives? That's good. Yeah. Well, the first thing, you need to take responsibility for your own life and your own state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking your primary responsibility is your sister's life and your sister's state of consciousness, it's not the case. You have to start with yourself. Change can only begin with yourself. Mm -hmm. So are you taking responsibility for your own state of consciousness rather than of believing unconsciously that, of course, you, you, you're worried and there's nothing else you can do? You have to look at the, what you call the worry in yourself, the continuous ma mind activity that dwells on negativity. See if you can enter that state of acceptance or presence and just be with yourself, I recommend to get out of the mind, go into the body several times a day and connect with the feeling of aliveness within. For yourself. So that the worry, the worry pretends, worry is part of the ego, it's the, it's the uh, compulsion to think Mm -hmm. incessantly, and it serves no purpose because it does, doesn't get you anywhere. It's similar to the complaining. It has no useful purpose. It's not, it doesn't bring about change in any situation. No matter how much you worry, it's never the worry that brings about any change in the situation. The mind may tell you you need to worry because it has some purpose. It doesn't. So the, the essential thing is that you get out of that unconscious habit of continuous worrying. So find a little bit of peace in yourself first to start with. And it may be more than a little bit of peace, but start with a little. Okay, is there, is there any peace in you underneath this continuous mental noise that we call worry? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in you? And you have to find that you can only be of true service to your sister. You can only be of Truly, truly be an agent for change in this world if something has changed in your state of consciousness. Otherwise, you contribute to the turmoil. So find through meditating, through bringing awareness to the present moment as much as possible, through bringing awareness into the inner body, as much as possible, get out of the mind and enter presence and realize the mind may tell you this is you're not helping your sister this is the beginning where you may, may be able to truly be of help to somebody else because the only thing you can do is really help yourself yes that's right yes but the mind tells you i have to save my sister yes and and that's the and what you're saying is that is not necessarily true no ultimately your sister is also responsible it right. doesn't mean that one human being cannot help another but you what is essential in when we ask whether you can be of help or not to another human being is is there something in you that can bring about change in the consciousness of another human being mm -hmm. unless some change has happened inside you it it can't happen. And what this may talk more generally about worry, this is the problem for many, many people, 
they wake up in the middle of the night worrying during the day they go about worrying about this or that what does it mean to worry what does it mean it means there is unconscious mind movement projecting itself usually into mm -hmm. the future and you see how dreadful the future is going to be what's going to happen you see outcomes that are negative many things of course are never going to happen but worry pretends to be necessary you have to see very clearly worry pretends to, to be necessary, necessary. Oh, I but got that. you have to see that it serves no useful purpose yeah worry pretends to be necessary yes. but serves no useful purpose and, and so once you see that it serves no useful purpose you can sometimes be maybe able to step out of that and see oh and then become present yeah you can become present if you can step out of the worry for a moment you can be come present and en enough to say what can I do now yes. how can I be now yes. in this moment yes for myself for my sister or for whatever it is you need yes okay. and the greatest gift you can give to somebody especially somebody who, who is uh, suffering like your sister when you are with them what is your state of consciousness are you able to bring presence when you connect with your with your sister or any other human being that you want to help can you be present with them can you give them space to be that's the healing 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 you can be an agent for healing of another not in the sense that i am going to heal you not believing right. that would be ego again so i'm going to heal, heal you. you no simply be there as a conscious space of presence not not wanting to do anything just being there as a conscious presence with another person that's very hard for people yes i understand it's that's, very hard for and people. that's why we call it the sh it's a shift from a the shift yeah yeah and I, I recognize how hard it is i'm reading this book now that uh from a guest is coming on the show called beautiful boy you might have heard of it uh it's the story of the father the father and the son both wrote a book together it's going to be on the oprah show later and his son was an addict for many years and very difficult for parents especially and as in this case uh, melissa a sister to a drug addict to stand by and watch somebody daily yeah, attempt to kill themselves through yes. drugs yes. yeah yes okay so and and but acceptance is also an important part of right. that it's at the moment you need to accept stop that resisting this is, it yes stop resisting not bringing it. the resistance always into the relationship because and whatever you fight you strengthen and what you resist persists yes that's at the top of page 75 yes whatever you fight you strengthen and what you resist persists why is that because that's how the by opposing you bring the, the, this world works in terms of polarities so if you strengthen one polarity you immediately strengthen the other uh, that's an physics physics mm -hmm. yes exactly the same physics yes. Yes. okay you say because these days you frequently hear the expression the war against that or this or that and whenever you hear that you know that it's condemned to failure there's a war against drugs against crime the war against terrorism against cancer against poverty and so on and despite the war against all of these things everything every one of those things is bigger than ever that's right yes. that's right yes. because what you fight you strengthen and what you resist persists yes and then the implication of course is there is another way of dealing with things with situations and that is to life. make peace with it make peace with it and then action take action the action then comes out of a different state of consciousness the action comes out of presence presence not it's no longer reaction yeah it comes out of presence and not out of you being defensive about it that's right i got it and the action is much more powerful and effective when it's not defensive and not negative we have uh, dana from monrovia liberia oh on the phone hello Hello, Oprah. Hello, Eckhart. Hello. It's Donna. Hi. Hi. It's Donna. Hi, Donna. How are you? Oh, yes. we're happy to Good talk evening. to Monrovia. Hello. Oh, thank you. Your question. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. My question. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with non-reaction in relationships. Uh, would it be the same to say that the opposite of love is, is not hate? but rather indifference. 
considering if one makes that situation not a personal one. Okay, that's your question. Yes, I don't fully understand the Thank question. You. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't leave, Donna. Reading. Go ahead. Concerning, concerning non-reaction. Uh huh. Yes. Would it be the same to say that the opposite of love is not hate, but rather indifference? And now, do you mean that non-reaction is indifference? Correct. That's what I'm asking. Oh, okay. Particularly if, if uh, one doesn't take it in a negative context. Okay. I'm not Meaning sure. Not I'll letting the negative one consume one okay. person. <laughs> okay. Well, um, non-reaction means that uh, you recognize when another human being displays some form of ego behavior, mm -hmm. wants to be right or wants you to be wrong or accuses you of this or that, whatever, many kinds, the ego manifests in many different ways. Uh, you recognize that that is its ego and you don't react to it, which means you don't confuse this behavior with who that human being is. It means you allow the ego to be there without fighting that behavior. For example, um, I had a, it happened some years ago, but it's an interesting example. I had a, a plumber come in to, to do some repair at my place. He was extremely aggressive mm -hmm. um, and rude. The plumber? The plumber. And I, I treated him as if he were a, a, a noble guest, very polite and said, explained what needed to be done because I recognized that perhaps he had been trapped in this pattern for years. Maybe it started with childhood when, when everybody around him was rude to him. So there was a deep-seated pattern of, of rudeness and unpleasant behavior and of regarding other people as enemies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't react because I recognized that as a dysfunction in him mm -hmm. that was, wasn't him at all. So I simply accepted his behavior and pointed out this needs to be done unless after 20 minutes he was changed completely. He was suddenly said, oh, thank you. For the first time, perhaps. Somebody some, was nice to him. Somebody was nice because everybody else reacted to him in the same way that mm -hmm. he acted. Mm -hmm. He got the reaction. Mm -hmm. And this is how most human beings encounter their daily reality. It's the cab driver situation. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for most people, their daily reality is really a reflection of their own inner, predominant inner state. And so the enlightened part of ourselves uh, after having reading this book, being awakened, we realize what you're saying here in chapter three, core of the ego. You should you should be able to recognize the ego not only in yourself but see it in other people. In other people. So when you see that kind of reaction from yes. someone, yes. you realize it's their ego. Yes. It's not them. That's right. So it's one could almost say it's it's like some an illness. It's, it's like a mental. So the presence in you then gets to respond to, yes. relate to the presence in them. Yes. And oh, you've got to be really highly evolved to do all that. It's, um, it's not indifference, by the way. This is not indifference. No, that's uh, You're not indifferent. You're that's compassionate. Compassion. Yeah. Yes. Understood. Yes. Understood. So, Understood. Uh, it's, in fact, it's, Yes, thank you for that clarity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, thank you, Donna. Now, the, the question is, do you, you say you need to be highly evolved. Well, yes. What, because most people just it react. Is, it you know? is true to say yeah. that um, at first it's, uh, the reaction is so automatic when some, somebody behaves unconsciously to react in the same way. It's very automatic. Mm -hmm. Now, as people begin to become more aware of their egos, usually after it's happened, they become aware that they reacted in the old ego way after, it's, after the event. Then, after a while, in the middle of reacting to somebody's ego, you suddenly become aware that, that that's what you're doing. Somebody just told me this last night, and this happens a lot, you know, with the airlines where, you know, my goodness, yes. if you can get from one, from point A to point B on commercial airlines these days without losing your luggage or flights being canceled or sitting on the tarmac or whatever, and they were reading the book, and in the midst of, you know, everything, you know, schedule for the flight, I'm sure this has happened to many of you. Schedule for the flight, everything's fine, you get there, and 
there's no seat. There's no seat. And people, other people didn't have their seats. And people around them were just imploding. And this person said that they um, decided to remain calm, as my godson, as a matter of fact. And people all around them were going nuts. And suddenly, out of nowhere, after about a half an hour, not out of nowhere, about a half an hour, the person behind the counter called the names. And of all the names that called, they called his, who had been sitting there calm. Now, they didn't know him from anybody else. but. You know, it, it eventually worked out. I'm not saying that it always works out, but he realized after reading the book that it makes no sense to get crazy. Yes, it's not only that, but also it's true that things are much more likely to work out when you are in a harmonious state of consciousness and not in resistance. Which brings us to page 77. Do you want peace or drama? Yes. You say, we all want peace. There's no one who doesn't want peace, yet there's something else in you that wants the drama, wants the conflict. And whenever you're moving in the drama, you, you can, as we all can, I think now, a little bit anyway, detach from the thought, see yourself having the thought, recognize that you, the you, the I of I am, is the awareness that you're having the thought. When you can see all the drama, just detach a little bit, you've done what? That's the, that's the vital thing, the, to see it in the midst of it, to suddenly become aware that this is an old pattern in yeah. you, an ego pattern in right. you. It may not even stop immediately, but at least there is an, suddenly there is a witnessing presence in the background. Yeah. That the ego wants to complain, the ego wants to be resentful, the ego wants drama. Yes. And yeah. to see that in oneself, we yes. could, one could call that almost there is in, in humans something that we could call the addiction to unhappiness. Mm -hmm. When you are unhappy for whatever reason, once you are trapped in that, that energy of unhappiness, you don't want to get out. <laughs> That's right. Because your ego loves it. Yes. So there is, a, there is an ad addiction to the, you actually, on some level, you enjoy your unhappiness. And when you can become aware of that, mm -hmm. then suddenly you're stepping out. So let's talk about the power of awareness you talk about on page 78. A power comes into your life that is far greater than the ego, greater than the mind. All that is required to become free of the ego is to be aware of it, since awareness and ego are uh, incompatible. This is page 78, first paragraph. Awareness is the power that is concealed within the present moment. This is why we may also call it presence. And the ultimate purpose of human existence, which is to say your purpose, is to bring that power or that presence into this world. Yes. That is why we're here. Yes. The, that is the universal, the impulse, the universal impulse is the evolution of consciousness. That is the, the impulse behind the universe. The universe is moving towards the evolution of consciousness. And we are one manifestation of the evolution of consciousness into this world. We're one. Yes, there are many others. Right. Uh, even a, a plant is a manifestation right, of that already. Right, right, right. But our ultimate purpose of human existence is to bring that presence, that awareness, into the world and to become more aware in our daily lives so that, regardless of what you're doing in your form world, in your form life, that you recognize, as you say on page 79, can I sense my essential beingness, the I am, in the background of my life at all times? Yes. To be more accurate, can I sense the I am that I am at this moment? Yes. And an easy step towards that is the inner acceptance of this moment as it is, mm -hmm. without wanting it to be different or rejecting it or resisting it. If you can accept, if you can see that the, the primary thing in your life is the present moment because there's never anything else. Yes. It's always now. So you must see if you can have a good relationship with the now because you don't, if you don't have a good relationship with the now, you don't have a good relationship with life because life is now. Yes. So accepting this moment as it is can connect you with that dimension of depth in yourself. And that is how we begin to quiet, quieten or quiet 
the ego. Yes. Is by being more fully present now. now. That's the exit out of, out of the ego, the now. Yeah. The now is the hidden exit because the ego doesn't want you to know that, that there is an exit and it's called now. Mm -hmm. Exit is the door out of the ego. Yeah. <laughs> the now is, is the door. The exit. Yes. The now, now is the exit door. Out of the ego. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so whenever you find yourself complaining, whenever you find yourself, uh, as we said last week, the need to feel superior, you feel superior, yeah or inferior, inferior to someone else. You know that it's your ego. Whenever you recognize that this is my ego and can bring yourself to the present moment of what is going on now yes. and can see yourself doing it. Yes. Yeah, that is awakening. Yes. Okay. Ginger is a singer, songwriter, living in Berlin uh, and is calling us via Skype. Hello? Hi, I call Berlin, you. Germany, hello. Hello. Hello, schöne Grüße aus Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, that meant hello, right? Uh, I was... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I feel like I am aware of, 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 of the things that I do that are, are destructive, and I can't seem to stop them anyway. I feel like I label things that are bad for me, and then I resist them, like eating fried food or drinking too much or relationships. I resist them, and I feel like it causes a source of anxiety, and sometimes the... Huge decisions in my life come easily, but these little things, little decisions every day, um, they pile up and become a source of anxiety. So my question is, is um, how can we get to this inspired action and effortless doing, um, not only when it comes to the big decisions, but when it comes to making healthy choices um, in our everyday lives? Amen. Good question. Thank you, Ginger. Yes. How did, yeah, because... Yeah, I was saying this to... Um, I know I'm doing it. I just do it anyway. Yeah. yeah, I was saying, yeah, aren't you... Yeah, why does it have to be a struggle just to to do the right thing in terms of, you know, for me, it's food always. It's always about food. Yes. How can it become effortless? Isn't that your question, Gen Ginger? Yeah. How, and are you talking how, about... For I, me, this would be about potato chips. What is this about for you? <laughs> for me, it's a red wine, a french fries. Okay. <laughs> A little red wine every now and then. And a few other things, of course, too. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. So uh, you mean when you eat French fries? And she knows that they're not so good for her. Okay. And then there's a voice in the head that says you shouldn't be eating them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, yeah. you are eating them. Mm -hmm. okay. A tennis match is more like it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of eating... Uh, Overeating has a lot to do with the ego also, because the ego lives in a constant state of not enough. It always seeks something else to fill itself with, and usually it's experiences to identify with this or that. Things. Things. But it's also uh, it, the, the need for more, as I call it, that is built into the ego. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it can get transferred to the body, and then you experience it as the desire to eat much more than the body really wants. It's to take in more. So really to, uh, to eat consciously really is the way out of it. For example, I would suggest that when you eat your French, French fries, fries. To, uh, <laughs> to make a meditation out of it and eat them consciously without having a secondary entity in your head that says you shouldn't be eating them. Eat them fully and consciously, and at the same time, feel how your body feels while you eat them and after you've eaten them. Then you bring some presence into it, and you may realize, in some cases, that the body doesn't actually want to eat them. It was the mind that wanted to eat the uh -huh. potato. But so. Bring, eat consciously. If you eat a sandwich, if you feel, if you go to the fridge, uh -huh. sometimes people get uh -huh. up in the middle of the night, they open the door, and, uh -huh. and you reach in, and there's this need for, I need to get, yeah. the body doesn't You're trying to it. feed something. Feed something, mm -hmm. yes. And so... To me, it's also, um, it's the, the anxiety that the resistance, not just for food, but things that I label as bad for me, seem to cause a lot of anxiety in the, 
What he's saying is stop resisting. Actually, after reading this book, I've been trying this lately, exactly what you said. And this is what you will find if you stop resisting it because the French fries are not bad. It's the thought in your head that has told you that the French fries are bad. And if you do what he re is recommending, if you sit and you consciously make it a meditation, what you will find is you won't eat, you know, two bags of French fries unconsciously, that you will enjoy every single French fry, and in the enjoyment and the pleasure, if you stop when it's, when it's no longer pleasurable, you know, it's, it's no longer ple pleasurable after three or four or five. By the time you've eaten a whole bag of them, you, you don't even taste it anymore. So he's saying make it a meditation, be with it, feel it, sense it, allow your whole body to be with it, feel it, sense it, yes. and when you're done with the pleasure of it, let it go. Yes. That is what you're saying, correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that's with the red wine, too. Yes. <laughs> and other things as well. I I, and other yeah. things as well. When yes. I was in be my... with it, be yes. with it. When I was in my 20s, as young people do, I would often get drunk. Um, Nowadays, I still enjoy a glass of wine. Right, I you do. I enjoy it very much. Yes. Um, and I know after I've had a one glass of wine, sometimes uh, does my body want another glass of wine? And usually, I kind of drink more than one glass. It's mm -hmm. very rare that I would drink two glasses mm -hmm. of wine because that's exactly the body says no more. So you can sense your body, it will often tell you whether it's right or not to that's eat right. or drink Well, something. that's a very good point that you just made. I just had an epiphany. Because you don't become overweight or even drunk or intoxicated as long as you are acting consciously. Yeah. It's when you become unconscious that you, be, that you eat too much, unconscious that you drink too much, unconscious is when you become obsessively indulgent yes. with things. Yes, yes. All these addictions are unconscious. Or unconscious. Ginger from Berlin, love that green you're wearing, girl. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Enjoy your uh, fries. Enjoy, yeah. I have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Consciously. Um, page 78, everybody. Uh, bottom paragraph. What is spiritual realization? The belief that you are spirit? You say, no, that is a thought. A little closer to the truth than the thought that believes you are who your birth certificate says you are, but still a thought. So we're not spirit? No. I thought we were spirit. What is that saying, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience? Yes, that's very good. But yes, but we're not spirit. No, that when we say we are spiritual beings having a human experience, is not yet the realization that we are, it's the belief that we are. Oh, okay. So there is a step that goes from the belief. Belief is still, it's a mental concept. It's a little closer, as I say, to believing that you are your, what your birth certificate says you are. Yes. But it's not the realization. No thought that you have about yourself is realization. Okay, well, this is another thing. You know, a lot of people are still very conflicted about this uh, spirituality and their religion. And what I hear you saying, feel you saying in this book is, is that this book isn't about believing. No. This book is about what you come to know for yourself. Yes. Yeah, what you become to feel for yourself. Yes. And that what you're saying is that God, in the essence of all consciousness, isn't something to believe. God is. Yes. God is. And God is a feeling experience, not a believing experience. That's right. And if, the, and if, you're, if that your religion is a believing experience, if God for you is still about a belief, then it's not truly God. No. That's what you're saying. Yes. The, okay. The, the best, uh, at best, a belief is a transitional thing, that yes. from, from there you go on to the realization that there is no separation between you and God, between you and the source of life, mm -hmm. that you are one with the source. And you cannot realize that through Believing. Thinking. It's not a belief. It's not a thought. It's not a thought. It's a direct realization within yourself, and it's there in the gap between two thoughts. Suddenly. That's right. Oh. <gasps> and conceptually, you may not know anymore. You may not have an opinion of who you are anymore, and yet, at a very deep level, there's a knowing that cannot be put into words. So, 
What is spiritualization? The belief that you are spirit? No, that's a thought. Closer to the truth than the thought that believes you are who you are, or that your birth certificate says you are, but still a thought. Spiritualization is to see clearly. On the bottom of page 78, everybody, spiritual realization is to see clearly that what I perceive, experience, think, or feel is ultimately not who I am, that I cannot find myself in all those things that continuously pass away. Yes, so you are the space for all those things. You are the consciousness, mm -hmm. the awareness, in which all those things, experiences, sense perceptions, thoughts, mm -hmm. emotions, mm -hmm. come, they appear. You are, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. That means you are the consciousness in which the world appears, is seen. And the consciousness itself has no form. It is formless and it is, has nothing to do with time. It is the dimension of the timeless in yourself. Eternity is the religious term for it. Okay. For most religious people, when you, they use eternity, it's a very abstract concept. Right. Eternity, what do I do with that? Or they believe it's continuous time that never ends. That would mm -hmm. be extremely boring if you were eternity and there's no end to time, it would become very boring. <laughs> I wouldn't want to things to go on forever in my life, to go on forever, ever, ever. But finding the timeless dimension is a very different thing in yourself. Timelessness is very different than eternity, as you're saying. I th the true meaning of eternity is timelessness. It's timelessness. It's usually misinterpreted as meaning endless uh, on time. On and on and on and on. Yeah. I got that. So it, there is in every human being Underneath all the stream of thinking and underneath the emotions, there is that dimension where timelessness or eternity dwells. And that is the essence of who you are. And that is consciousness itself. And you can know it by realizing that you are the space for whatever happens in your life. Mm. The space of consciousness. Deep. I must say that's pretty deep there, Eckhart. We're on page 80, everybody. One of my favorite quotes in the entire book uh, that actually I used in one of our ads in O Magazine. Only the truth of who you are, if realized, will set you free. Yes. Yes. Know who you are and you are free. But to know who you are doesn't mean that suddenly you have an answer in your head. There's a stillness. And in that stillness, when you accept that you don't know who you are, as I say somewhere in the book, mm -hmm. when you completely accept that you've realized all the things that you thought you were is not really who you are. And then you come to a point where you don't know who you are. And if you can fully accept that you don't know who you are, you're closer to who you are than you were ever before. Once you realize and accept that all structures, page 81, forms are unstable, even the seemingly solid material ones, peace arises within you. This is because the recognition of the impermanence of all forms awakens you to the dimension of the formless within. Yes. That's what you're calling timelessness. Yes. That which is beyond death, Jesus called it eternal life. Eternal life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So you believe what happens to us at death when the body dies? I you don't, don't have a belief. I don't give it any thought. You don't? No. Well. Did you ever think about it, Eckhart? <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that the essence of who I am, which is the essence of who you are, is indestructible. Uh, I know that directly as a, on a feeling level. And you can also know it even if you talk to a physicist. He will tell you that energy never gets destroyed. It can only Change transform. Forms. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that animates this physical form, at some point, whatever it is that animates this physical form is going to no longer an animate this form. And that is when you see a dead body. And when you see a dead body, you see, I, a, a year and a half ago, both my parents died within a space of a few months. And I saw very clearly, I, each time I, I saw that my mother's body lying there. A few months later, I saw my father's body lying in the coffin. And I realized the form was still there, but the, the essence of that being was not present. So the, so the essence of that being was never the form. It was 
gone. It was no longer there. And then when the when that which animates the form... The essence of that being was never the form. Was never. The essence of that being inhabited the form. Yes, because... And now it no longer inhabited yes, the form. Yes, so you could see there was only a shell there. Right. And that was... It's such a clear realization. Yeah, All, many people who've seen their loved ones in the casket see that. Yes. So that which was the, that, the, the life within that form was always invisible. All you could ever see was the form. Maybe you could sense the life within ah. the form, but the, the life is always invisible, and the life ultimately has no form itself. Mm. And so you see, suddenly somebody dies, the essence is gone, the life within the form mm -hmm. is gone. So what you're saying, again, on page 79, is to be able to be in form mm -hmm. and be able to sense the formlessness yes. of yourself. Yes. To be in form and to sense that there is an essential beingness or formlessness, formlessness the I am in the background of our life at all times. Yes. And that awareness, that formlessness, is what can... It can um, hear, see, sense the thoughts yes. that are going on all the time. And there's a little space, just a space, between the thoughts and the awareness of the thoughts. Yes. And that is where we, I, reside. Yes, you are the awareness, you are consciousness. Appearing as a person for a little while, but in essence, you are consciousness, and consciousness is, as consciousness, you are timeless. You are eternal in the sense of timeless. And when the form itself is lying there in the casket, that timeless formlessness has gone where? Transform to have either to join with the source mm -hmm. or to go through further experiences of the experiences of awakening. Mm. In ways that our mind cannot even comprehend. No. Okay. Before we say goodbye, I want to thank all of you around the world for making this remarkable experience uh, possible. Eckhart and I will be here again next Monday at 8 p.m. Central. This third class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And uh, if you want to download a podcast of any of our three classes, you can do that tomorrow at Oprah.com and iTunes. So what did you want to say in conclusion about the core of the ego? The core of the ego... The ego, sometimes we look at it as if it were an entity, mm -hmm. but really it's just a form of unconsciousness. It appears to be an entity sometimes. Uh, it is not threatening, never regard it as an enemy or, or something that you need to get rid of. It's only to be recognized for what it is. Mm -hmm. So, and then the ego has fulfilled its purpose. It has taken you to that point of awakening. So, in order to awaken, humans have, uh, were in the state of oneness with the source when they first came here, and then they lost themselves. They lost mm. themselves in thinking, they lost themselves in the mind, they lost themselves in the ego. And then they reached the stage where the, this state of being lost produces so much suffering that the, this dream of life becomes a nightmare and they start waking up in this the stage that we have reached now. So when we, as we wake up, we regain the state that we once had, that we, want, we lost the state of oneness with life, oneness So we're waking with God, up now. Oneness with the source. Mm -hmm. But when we regain it, we regain it at a deeper level because we are conscious of it now. Wonderful. Thank you can't wait till next week because, you know, this week we're talking about all the things that form the core of the ego, how the ego loves to complain and it loves to be right and it loves drama and all of that. Next week we talk about role playing all the many uh, faces of the ego, how so many of us believe that we are the roles that we play. That's next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Another night. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Good.